In this presentation, a long oblique fracture of the femur will be stabilized using four cerclage wires, followed by normal grade insertion of an intramedullary pin. The objectives are to show the indications for cerclage wire application and intramedullary pinning, the instruments and implants needed, the patient position and approach, and the reduction and stabilization of the fracture. In general, this technique should only be used in diaphyseal fractures. The fracture length should be at least twice the diameter of the bone, and full reconstruction of the bone cylinder must be possible. The instruments and implants needed are, from left to right, the large pointed reduction forceps, the toothed reduction forceps, the wire tightener with handle and two pegs, the flat-nosed parallel pliers, the small wire cutter, and four 1.25 mm cerclage wires with eye. Also needed are the compact air drive or a similar device, the chuck and key, and two 4.5 mm diameter Steinmann pins used for the intramedullary pinning. The patient is positioned in lateral recumbency on the surgical table with the injured limb uppermost. A lateral approach to the proximal femur is used. To begin, the proximal end of the femur is secured in the vise. The pointed reduction forceps is applied to the distal end of the bone and traction is used to reduce the fracture. The toothed reduction forceps is placed at the proximal end of the fracture. The pointed reduction forceps is now moved to the distal end of the fracture to secure the alignment of the fragments during application of the cerclage wires. Generally, cerclage wires should be equally spaced between one half and an entire bone diameter apart. The order in which the cerclage wires are applied is given by the position of the forceps. A curve is made in the straight end of a cerclage wire with I, and this end is passed around the bone with the help of the parallel pliers. The straight end of the wire is inserted through the eye at the other end of the wire. The wire is pulled using the parallel pliers, and the eye is slid down to the bone, here using the thumb. In surgery, an instrument would be used, for example the periosteal elevator, the end of the wire is then passed through the opening in the bottom of the wire tightener. The wire tightener is slid down to the bone. The wire is now passed through the hole in the center of the peg. The peg is positioned in a slot of the wire tightener. It's given a quarter turn and the excess wire is trimmed. The peg is turned to tighten the wire. Tension is maintained by keeping pressure on the peg handle. The wire tightener is bent over at least 90 degrees to lock the cerclage in place. While pulling on the wire tightener, the peg is turned in the reverse direction to release approximately one or two centimeters of wire. The wire should be kept under tension. The wire tightener is straightened up while its tip is pushed down towards the bone to form the arm which secures the cerclage. The wire is trimmed close to the tightener. The arm is pressed to the surface of the bone using an instrument. Another cerclage wire is applied in the same manner. At this point, both reduction forceps are removed to allow space for cerclage wires at the proximal and distal ends of the fracture. A 4.5 mm diameter intramedullary pin is inserted into the chuck and secured with the key. In a clinical case, when an intramedullary pin is used in combination with cerclage wires, the diameter of the pin should be approximately 70% of the diameter of the medullary cavity in the region of the femoral isthmus. 
The intramedullary pin is inserted in a normal grade fashion. The landmark is the greater trochanter. The tip of the intramedullary pin is positioned on the proximal part of the trochanter and slid medially into the trochanteric fossa. This is the point of entry. To avoid slippage, the tip of the pin is first seated into the metaphysial bone in a cranial direction. Once the tip starts penetrating the bone, the pin is directed towards the patellar region and driven distally along the caudal cortex of the femur. There will be an increase in resistance when the pin penetrates the distal metaphysial region. This is the time to check the depth of penetration, so the pin is released from the chuck. To verify the depth, another pin of the same length is held alongside the visible portion of the pin that protrudes from the bone. The end of the pin should lie at the proximal edge of the patella and must not penetrate the articular surface. Although in a clinical situation the pin is trimmed, here the pin is left intact and is removed at the end of the exercise. The pin can also be inserted by hand with the universal chuck with T-handle. Here are the post-operative radiographs of the model. In general, this technique should only be used in diaphyseal fractures. The fracture length should be at least twice the diameter of the bone, and full reconstruction of the bone cylinder must be possible. It should be noted that a minimum of two cerclage wires must be used. Usually, cerclage wires are equally spaced between one half and an entire bone diameter apart. Due to the caudal bowing of the distal femur, the intramedullary pin is driven distally along the caudal cortex so that the pin does not exit through the cranial cortex.